The following presentation was recorded at the Buddhist Society of Victoria, Malvern East, Australia. Please visit our website at bsv.net.au. Very nice. Nice to see people here on this day, just before Christmas, this Sunday before Christmas, because people are now, I think, quite busy getting ready for the Christmas holidays. And most people, I think, started perhaps the holiday period. So just to begin by introducing myself yet again, we have this Latin phrase, ad, ad nauseum, <laughs> ad nauseum, ah, we know who he is. But for the people online too, and for those that are new here perhaps today, uh, my name is Ajahn Nisarano, and I'm an Australian monk who ordained with Ajahn Brahm in Perth in Western Australia. Now it's, uh, since my full ordination, 22 years. So that's quite a while. But for the last uh, 13 and a half years, I have been living in Sri Lanka and visiting Australia. So that's, uh, uh, and I come and visit the BSV, the Buddhist Society of Victoria, usually annually now. And I was a lay, when I was a lay person, I was a member of the BSV. <laughs> so this is, I was actually, I helped with their library here. So I always like to encourage people to think of at uh, the Buddhist community as a continuum, not a big divide between monastics and the lay community. The monastics were lay people before they became monastics. <laughs> so you too can become a monastic too, if that opportunity comes your way. It's not easy actually for, for most people. You need quite a lot of supporting good karma, you know, the situation's got to be right for it. So today, uh, to continue sort of the the theme of Christmas and everything in a way, is a very happy birthday wishes to Kanti and Dr. Jai. Is Kanti here? I don't think so. Dr. Jai is. It's their birthday today. Um, I won't say how old, don't worry. <laughs> it's terrible to say that, actually. And, so that's, and Dr. Jai has been a, a great supporter of the BSV for such a long time and practicing the Buddha's teachings for such a long time with such good understanding. And we also dedicate merit to uh, Kanti's husband, Percy, who passed away in September, I think. Was it September? Mm. Uh, so almost three months. I think it's three months now. And just as a, by way of an encouragement, it leads into the theme for the talk today too. And it's, I, I quite like this. It's quite a, a, a striking saying by the Buddha, many striking sayings from the Buddha. And this is called uh, Overcoming Birth and Death. And he says here, if three things were not found in the world, the perfect one, this is the Buddha, the holy one who is fully enlightened would not appear in the world, nor would this, his teaching and discipline shed their light over the world. What are these three things? They are birth, old age and death. Because of these three, because these three are found in the world, the perfect one, the holy one, who is fully enlightened, has appeared in the world and his teaching and discipline shed their light over the world. It is, however, impossible to overcome birth, old age and death without overcoming another three things, namely greed, hatred and delusion. So this is, this is our task, actually. <laughs> and also on a birthday, you think this is the, the message of a birthday is that the Buddha is saying, you know, the end of all our um, defilements, the end of all unsatisfactoriness, suffering in life is the ending of birth. So on a birthday, we can reflect like that. And Buddhists often say things like, you know, at the uh, monastery, Ajahn Brahm's monastery, you know, in Western Australia, sometimes we have birthday cards. We used to have birthday cards. One of the lay persons would bring a birthday card and we'd all sign it. I think birthday cards are great because if you want to, you know, um, do away with thinking, just have a birthday card in front of you that you think you've got to write something, you know, uh, for a birthday. It's great. It clears the mind. It's a great device. So if you're having a lot of trouble with thinking during the meditation, think, oh, I've got to do a birthday card. <laughs> It'll clear the mind immediately. But usually some of the things we say is, don't get born again, <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. So um, 
that's the uh, the message of birthdays, really. But of course, to do that is is not an easy matter. And the wisdom and the purity of mind have to be there. Purity of mind gives rise to the wisdom that we can see the world, see things as they truly are. And then that's a natural consequence to let go of the world. So I was just going to, uh, this is going to move around a bit, this talk, I can see it. I was just going to mention I was at Newbury Monastery this week, actually. I went on Tuesday and came back yesterday. So it was very nice to go there. And very important we have these places that are like... Um, um, refuges, really, aren't they? Refuges or sanctuaries of peace. And you always hear when people go to Bodhinyana and, and I think to, Saint, uh, to Newbury too, that people feel that peace there because you're in a natural environment and it's, it's a very, and the whole focus, the whole energy of the community is towards developing peace and wisdom. So I was at Newbury and that was very nice. Then on Thursday, we had a hot day. Did you have a hot day here? <laughs> I thought it was 43-something here in Melbourne. In Newbury, it was just 40. <laughs> so it was quite, quite warm enough. But it really, it, being there was a very interesting experience on that day because it was uh, the, uh, the warning for that day was severe bushfire warning. It's not the most uh, extreme or even on top of that catastrophic now these days. And it was very interesting because when you have these severe ones, severe um, bushfire warning, you have to be ready to evacuate any moment. So, you know, the, the whole community could feel in the air this sort of tension because of what's happening at the moment in New South Wales, what's been happening in South Australia, what's been happening in Western Australia too. So it's in the mind and that you have this feeling that any moment you may have to evacuate. And they're very prepared, I must admit, they're really well organised, though of course one gets tested when it comes to the actual event. But they have a, a large shopping bag, one of these cloth shopping bags, in, for each, each person's room. And it's got their emergency stuff in it, so it's got goggles and it's got a, a face, uh, face mask so you, for dealing with smoke and gloves. And then the instruction is to put everything you need to take with you that day if you have to evacuate, you know, a few clothes or whatever is important. I thought, wow, this is a very good test because you remember maybe last week, I think, I was talking about Shadston, the shopping centre nearby, being the Tanha test, the test of our wanting, our craving, our desires. But this one bag is too <laughs> because you think, what's really important? And, of course, the things you put in there are your attachments too as well as, you know, the things that you... You know, you think, well, they'll be useful if I have, you know, some spare clothes and that sort of thing, especially cotton on those, those sorts of things. I did hear a rather humorous story that they had a, I don't know if, it, I think it was a real one, evacuation in Trentham, and they had to go to the Oval or some, some meeting place. And one elderly woman turned up with a chair. And they said, why did you bring the chair? She said, well, I didn't know what to bring. <laughs> I imagine it was a folding chair, a light one. I thought that was beautiful. So uh, considering the, this experience at Newbury, you know, and what happened, of course, during the day was, you know, you were ready for it. But these days people are very, very prepared. So you have the Country Fire um, Authority and they have a well, there's an, a Vic, Vic Emergencies um, app so you can be aware of what's happening in your area, which is fantastic, you know, it's really good. So fortunately there was no, um, there was no need to evacuate and even though we could see smoke, we couldn't smell it and I thought, well, that's good, <laughs> that's good. So we were very, uh, very thankful and I think this is the experience throughout Australia now because of the fires and it's very, very common. But it brings up, of course, what teaching does that bring up to your mind for those who... It's impermanence, yes. But there's a particular teaching that the Buddha gave. And this links to the theme for today, if we ever get to it. It's a famous, it's the third teaching of the Buddha. The, see, I think I heard it. The fire sermon, yes. The Dita Pariyaya Sutta. And so I thought I'd read that because it connects very well with what uh, I'm going to discuss today, which we'll get on to. 
And this, because very often people haven't much exposure to the Buddha's actual teachings. They hear, you know, monks, nuns, lay men, lay women teaching. So this one is called um, burning. It's burning. So it goes with this image. <laughs> and it says, on one occasion, the Blessed One was dwelling at Gaia, at Gaia's head. This is near uh, where he gave the first uh, sermon at uh, Buddha Gaya or Bodh Gaya, together uh, at Savati, at, um, yes, together with a thousand bhikkhus. There, the Blessed One addressed the bhikkhus thus. Bhikkhus, or monks, all is burning. And what monks is the all that is burning? And then the eye is burning, forms are burning. Eye consciousness, the ability for the mind to register, is burning. Eye contact is burning. And whatever feeling arises from, with eye contact as condition, whether pleasant or painful or neither, painful nor pleasant. This too is burning. And the Buddha says, burning with what? Burning with what? And he says, burning with the fire of lust, with the fire of hatred, with the fire of delusion, burning with birth, aging and death, with sorrow, lamentation, pain, displeasure and despair, I say. And then the Buddha goes on to talk about the ear is burning, the nose is burning, the tongue is burning, the body is burning, and it's the same progression. And then he says the mind is burning, and whatever, and it goes through the same progression again. So let's go through that. Uh, the, the thoughts or the experiences in the mind, mind consciousness is burning, the contact, mind contact is burning, and whatever feeling that arises with mind contact as condition, whether pleasant or painful, or neither painful nor pleasant. That too is burning. Burning with what? Burning with the fire of lust, with the fire of hatred, with the fire of delusion, burning with birth, aging and death, with sorrow, lamentation, pain, displeasure and despair, I say. And this is the and the Buddha continues. So, seeing thus, monks, the instructed noble disciple experiences turning away from the eye, turning away from forms, turning away from eye consciousness, turning away from eye contact, uh, turning away from whatever feeling arises from eye contact as condition, whether pleasant or painful, or neither painful nor pleasant turning away uh, from the ear and with the other senses, turning away from the mind, turning away from the feelings arising from mind contact as condition. And they experience this turning away. Having experienced this turning away, they become dispassionate. Through dispassion, the mind is liberated. When it is liberated, there comes the knowledge. It is liberated. He understands or she understands. Destroyed his birth, the holy life has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There is no more for this state of being. <coughs> this is what the Blessed One said. Elated, those bhikkhus delighted in the Blessed One's statement. And while this discourse was being spoken, the minds of the thousand monks were liberated from the taints by non-clinging. So that's enlightenment. So that is that is the fire sermon, and it's a wonderful uh, a wonderful teaching actually about the the experience of where these negative states arise, how they arise from our sense contacts, from through the through the eye, through the the nose, the tongue, um, the body, the ears, and through the mind, and so this gives us an idea of the the causation for it, and. But today, I was going to focus on the, the subject of the talk is uh, aversion or hate, who gets burnt first. So you might remember last month, I gave a talk on greed. Uh, this is a 
one of the roots, one of the negative roots in our mind, and non-greed. This is the opposite of greed. So today we'll be about talking about aversion or hate and the opposite of that, non-aversion, non-hate. So, no, no, that's all right. I probably won't play that one, actually. There's another one I would rather have played, but I forgot it. <laughs> so, so, no, that's all right. Oh, all right. Yeah, I suppose it oh, yes, can get it from, yes, yes, anyway, I may show it at the end. It's quite, quite a nice one, good for Christmas, anyway. So, I was going to start, first of all, with uh, a quiz. This is what I used for the, uh, the teens group, the teens group, and this is a, like a quiz for you. Now, the, the, com the quotation, who said the following quotation? Holding on to anger is like grasping a hot coal with the intent of throwing it at someone else. You are the one who gets burnt. Who said that? Any ideas? Hmm? That's what I thought too. <laughs> but not so. But not so. I've been, I think I've even said that, that the Buddha said that, but I've heard it from other teachers. Of course, it's perfectly in keeping with what the Buddha teaches because, you know, that anger is inside us and we're the ones that get burnt first, actually. And the other person, as I often say, may duck, in which case the hot coal will fly past them. So we'll have the burnt hand and they won't. But it's, I, I was searching for where this quotation came from the Buddha's teachings. I thought it must be there. Of course, what came up? Fake Buddha quotes website. <laughs> I thought, oh dear, this is very good. And it said, it said, and I think it's quite, quite the case, it was Venerable Buddha Gosa, who was a famous commentator in the 5th century AD, who did a lot of uh, the commentaries, particularly the Vasudhimagga, the Path of Purity. A fantastic work, I mean, amazing. And the quotation from him about anger is when he was discussing anger in the Vasudhimagga, the path to purification, he says, when we're angry, by doing this, you're like a man who wants to hit another and picks up a burning ember or excrement in his hands and so first burns himself or makes himself stink. And that's, that's the quote. And that's, that's quite, I mean, that's a very good, very good quote, so... And so this points to the fact that, you know, we're the ones that get burnt first. And, uh, and we're, we're the ones smelling if we pick up excrement. I think you'd have to be pretty angry <laughs> to do that. So this is, uh, the focus today will be this negative uh, root of anger, hatred, aversion, and the opposite too. And this is where it ties in with Christmas, because of course the opposite is goodwill. The opposite of an aversion, uh, anger, hatred is goodwill. I like to use uh, aversion mainly because sometimes people think, well, I, I, I don't hate very many people or, or very many things, you know, and we may think that. But of course, for the Buddha, you know, this negative root in our minds is actually all shades of aversion, all shades of rejection of what we're experiencing. So, uh, this is really the meaning of um, a dosa, this, this unwholesome root, this aversion as I'm calling it. And I think we can do, I I'm often refer to Chadston these days, it's not advertising. <laughs> Actually I should say for the people on the internet, Chadston is a shopping centre in, in Melbourne. It's supposed to be the biggest in the southern hemisphere, it was anyway, it's hard to believe it still is. but. This is my Chadston test for aversion. When you go to the shopping centre, and now it's fairly, fairly frantic, isn't it? It's Christmas. To get a parking spot is difficult. So my test is when, when you see a parking spot and somebody else sees a parking spot, can you say, after you, <laughs> from your heart? Now that is really, that's really showing one's practice. If you can, that's great. You're doing really well. And so now we'll change to the next, uh, uh, the next photo, which is actually what the theme was really going to be about. But it's really the roots within our mind. Because we see that, you know, this anger, oftentimes we, we tend to think it's out there. It's that person at work, you know, a family member, somebody at school, whoever. 
hopefully not somebody at the Buddhist Society. They're the problem. They're the problem. But in actual fact, the problem, where is the problem? It's in us. If we didn't have anger, if we didn't have aversion or irritation, annoyance, all those sorts of things, would it be possible for us to get upset, get angry? If a Buddha was here, he couldn't. There is no, there's no capability for it. There's nothing inside that will suddenly react in a negative way. Is that good? Can we get that? Oh, that looks good. Can you see it? Ah, there we are. So this is, this is supposed to be showing a tree with its roots, which is very nice and quite a nice tree. But the tree uh, needs the roots to, to sustain itself and it gives stability to it and, uh, uh, and it holds, holds the tree up, doesn't it? And this is what the roots in our mind are like too. And these roots are underground often, we don't see them. And this is where meditation is very useful. We can actually see, and mindfulness particularly, we can become aware of what's going on underground. And so the Buddha says, said, uh, taught that there are the three negative ones, the three negative roots, and this, as I mentioned, is greed, or you could say desire, aversion, and delusion. So those three. And they lead very uh, lead to unhappiness. They, in the case of a tree, could lead to disease and stunt one's growth. And the three positive ones are non-greed, non-aversion, and non-delusion, which lead to health and well-being. And to the tree really flourishing to its maximum potential, leading to growth. So, as I mentioned, this is the, uh, the essence of Christmas, is the goodwill. So it's the opposite of aversion and uh, this hatred. It's that non-aversion covers loving kindness, compassion, non-harming ourselves or others, patience, any of these things, any of these positive qualities. But when we see an image like this, it reminds us that uh, this image that I often use, that our minds are like a garden, and in that garden, we can cultivate uh, what we wish and we can nourish the roots of the plants in the garden and we can nourish those that are useful and beneficial, uh, maybe uh, beautiful, beautiful plants, flowers, or we can uh, cultivate, we can nourish, we can water the weeds in our minds, the poisonous plants in our minds. And of course, um, the negative ones, the weeds and the poisonous plants in the mind. This is greed, hatred and delusion in a big way. And oftentimes people don't realize <laughs> they're watering those plants. They're, they're giving them uh, manure, fertilizing those plants just by repeating things, repeating negative actions of body, speech and mind again and again. They become the habit of the mind. They become strong roots within that tree. They become, you know, almost defining characteristics of the person. I'm an angry person. I hardly ever hear people say I'm a greedy person, but <laughs> they usually say that I'm an angry person or a grumpy person, or other people may say that, <laughs> more likely. So these, uh, when whatever we repeat, whether it be a positive or it be a negative quality, that will become the strength in the mind. And as I mentioned last week, we can do the uh, test case when we, when we give our attention to anything to see what quality it is uh, resulting from giving attention to that. Is it a positive quality, kindness, generosity, um, forgiveness, all these things? Or are we getting developing a negative qualities? Is there a lot of irritation, anger, fault finding in the mind? What are we developing? But in the end, the Buddha is saying to us, you know, it's up to us what we cultivate, what we develop, how we develop the garden of the mind. It's up to us. Um, however, we will find that we, we, having developed, you know, strong negative qualities in the mind, in our speech, in our actions, for instance, we will see, most people will see the results of that. Not good, <laughs> not enjoyable, not pleasant. So hopefully we learn, you know, what, what is beneficial to us, what brings happiness, what brings development and growth for ourselves and for others. And we develop, we strengthen those roots rather than the negative roots. 
I don't think anybody needs to um, a definition of aversion or hate or uh, these sorts of things. And you know, when I did the teens group, I had them also just close their eyes and focus on what that feeling is like. But it's very important for um, you know for dealing with these negative emotions to know what we're dealing with, to be prepared, to understand. You know, this is, as I mentioned last week, the first noble truth the Buddha teaches is that, you know, this unsatisfactoriness, this discontent, this suffering in the mind has to be fully understood. He doesn't, it, you know, it's it shying away from it. We cannot, you know, understand it and make the breakthrough, find out what the cause for our uh, situation is. So the cause for anger and uh, hatred as we're discussing today. So it's very important to know something in its fullness so that we can actually then do something about it. Otherwise, we're in the dark, really. And as I mentioned, for the Buddha, all the shades of negativity can come under the umbrella of this uh, dosa or aversion. And it includes, can include fear, anxiety, dread, panic, and even jealousy is interesting, isn't it? It's a mixture of greed and, and uh, hatred at the same time. But the underlying emotion of, of uh, uh, aversion, what, what do you think the underlying emotion is? Fear, yeah, it can be, yes. No. It's even more basic than fear, actually. Hatred, and it's a bit more basic than that too. It's rejection, you know, that resistance or rejection is often, I think, uh, um, is, is the essence of this aversion of hatred, all these negative emotions, just as the quality that underlies um, the greed, for instance, is attraction. So you can often see these two, greed and hatred, as being attraction and repulsion. And it's interesting, isn't it, when you think, is life that simple? <laughs> But it, it is actually, when you look at it, well, it's quite true. But we have to look at it in terms of our own experience and recognize this. But yeah, there's this, uh, you know, uh, attraction and repulsion going on. This liking and disliking, you know, and giving rise when we have a pleasant feeling. We like things usually and then we want them. This is a tanha craving. And then if that's really important, we will really hold on to that as an important thing in our lives. So we start to uh, um, cling to it. And the, and the opposite is true. If it's a, a negative uh, feeling arises from the experience, then we'll want to get rid of it. We won't like it. And when we, when we don't like something, we usually we can react and want to get rid of it. Uh, so this can be the usual way we react to things. So this attraction and repulsion is pushing us about. So I just wanted to, just to mention very briefly some of the roots that go into some of the details. These are the sub-roots, the sub-roots of aversion or hatred and some of the internal ones uh, that, uh, that cause, cause these uh, uh, emotions, these negative roots to become stronger. And for instance, with aversion, one of the things that really... Uh, uh, winds us up, causes us, is our attachments. If our attachments get threatened in any sense, then this anger and aversion comes up. And it's actually a very good way to look at, um, you know, look at the causes for aversion, hatred, these negative qualities in the mind. So the Buddha talks about the, uh, our sense pleasures as being one of these attachments. That uh, is uh, that we we are attached to, we hold on to, and a very good simile that he used is the simile of the bird. You know, the bird that's got a piece of meat, and the other birds start to attack it because it's got this piece of meat. And the Buddha says, if this bird doesn't drop the meat, will it come to deadly suffering or or be killed? And the monks say, yes, it will be. It's in the same way, this sort of sense of uh, competition, fear that we'll miss out on our uh, things that we find 
are very pleasant through the through the eyes, through the ears, through the nose, through the body, through the tongue. That's a biggie, isn't it? <laughs> Our favourite foods. And this can cause, you know, feelings of ill will, especially if there's competition. If you see your favourite food, and there are a number of other people heading for the same favourite food, you may you may ex- experience oh, <laughs> this feeling. So this is a, an aspect. To look at our attachments is very, very useful in, in life. And the sensual sense pleasures, to see how much we rely on them. Um, and one of the very good examples, it's, uh, it stands out actually, really, because sexu- sexuality is such a strong thing in human beings, is the competition for partners. And I was just remembering when I thought of that, you know, when there's... A, then when there's a contender for the same person, you know, whether it be a man or a woman, then, then, then real anger and ill will can get going in a big way. And in the 19th century, they used to have these jewels, didn't they? This is not, not J-E-W-E-L, this is D-U-E-L, I think it's spelled. And they used to fight with swords and kill each other. You know, this is amazing, isn't it? But it's not that different from what animals do too, actually. But this is ill will, this is hatred. And it's very easy to see when we see it with, in those, um, with something that's very, very strong, a strong attachment for people. But one of the biggest things we see, what is, what's another thing that you, you, you see is a great cause of um, div- division, of uh, aversion, hatred. It's a very biggie. It's another attachment, actually. And of course, this is views and opinions. Don't you think that that's a big one? That's really big. And this covers, you know, politics. You see that a lot. Though in Australia, people are pretty laid back about politics. In Sri Lanka, they can get really wound up. Religion can come into that. Social causes can, you know, like the moment we have climate change. And uh, one of the things you see that a lot of activists will use, it's quite a negative quality to use, is the energy of, of uh, aversion, of hate, of ill will, because they're right. They know what they're doing is right. And they can use this energy. And this is where anger and aversion have an attraction for people. They get energy. It's very uh, intense and consuming, unpleasant experience, isn't it, when we're angry? when we've got a lot of anger, hatred and so on. But there's a sense of, you know, of energy, of, of you know, being able, capable of doing anything, and it's true. <laughs> so, and I, I remember, um, I think I mentioned this before, a Quaker friend of mine in Perth, she mentioned that uh, two peace activists had come to the Quaker meeting house, and she said, her observation was, they were the most unpeaceful people I'd met. <laughs> Presumably because they were so motivated by causes, you know, they, they were really angry and, uh, and so on. And recent times we saw uh, Greta Thunberg at the UN was like that, actually really wound up. So there is energy there. What's, and another thing that's very causes a lot of ill will to come up, and this is particularly important for us actually, is um, this view of ourselves you know, view of a self being in here. The Buddha said this is a very strong thing we cling to, we attach to. Um, and this view of an identity, it's sometimes called identity view, whatever we take as I, me, mine, myself, you know. And there's so much that we do, we identify with. And in the process, this can cause a lot of division, can cause a lot of anger, ill will. Gender is one, one thing, uh, one amongst many. Religion, race, um, ethnicity, sexuality. You can name it. The things that we, whatever we identify with, whatever we take to be me, the essence of mine, myself, uh, that can become the cause for uh, bringing up this ill will, bringing up aversion, bringing up hate. Because, you know, we're so identified with it. All identification is a liability, really, in, in the Buddha's teaching. And the Buddha gave a lovely simile for this to the monks. 
he said one, one day the, someone was clearing up all the leaves, branches and bits and pieces and taking them away and burning them. They were burning them. And the Buddha said to the monks, monks, are you upset that people uh, you know, are taking these leaves and these branches and, and burning them? And the monk said, no, 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 blessed one, not at all. They're not, they don't belong to us. They're not ours. And in the same way, the Buddha said, what is not ours? The body and the mind. He goes into a teaching about that. Because whatever we cling to, whatever we think is ours, that gives rise, can give rise to these feelings of greed, hatred and delusion. But one of the big things too that comes with, I was, there's a nice video that goes with this but no time for it, is um, what the sense of self too can be a sense of self-hatred. You know, that this is a very common feature in the West particularly. And it can uh, generate these sort of feelings of low self-esteem, depression, all these things, and suicide as well. So this all comes from that sense of self, you know, who I am and what I identify with, those things. And the negative self-talk that can go with that, often, you know, um, conditioned from other, outside ourselves, but we've believed it and we keep repeating it to ourselves. I'm no good at this. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not like this. I can't do that. All these things. And as I say, and the last thing the Buddha mentions as an attachment is rites and rituals. Rites and rituals. And that's anything uh, we think, any th way of doing things that we think is absolutely essential. And that can cause for us, you know, a division with other people because they may not see it that way at all. So, and just to, yeah, just to uh, mention too, the externally, of course, there can be through our, our body, we talk about this is the mind we're talking about largely at this stage up to now, but also, also our speech and our actions too, they can be a source for um, this aversion to manifest in our speech. We have hate speech, don't we? We have hate speech, which really aims to create division, disharmony, and incite violence in some cases. And the Buddha, of course, is saying to us the four ki kinds of wrong speech that he mentions, and they can be used for uh, creating this sort of aversion in the mind. Lying, divisive speech, that's essentially... Um, coming from aversion, ill will, harsh speech, you know, and gossip too. And also the actions that the Buddha is talking about is breaking the precepts, isn't it? Can be an um, expression of greed, hatred and delusion, or greed, aversion and delusion, killing living beings, stealing, sexual misconduct, lying and taking alcohol and drugs. So these things, uh, looking at some of the things that bring up uh, bring up these negative states of mind. But I think it's very good, when I was preparing for this talk, I realised how much in our society, in a way, encourages a lot of this uh, negative negativity in terms of aversion. And one of the biggies is competition. You look at see it, competition. I mentioned the birds, you know, the flying, uh, attacking another bird that had meat. But this sense of competition and not working together you know, looking after ourselves, competing with others, is often seen as a great, uh, a good thing. And I'm sure in some situations it could be. But it can actually lead to aggression, self-absorption, a lack of empathy with other people, what they're going through. And we can see it in sport. <laughs> we can see it in gaming. I wonder about children, you see, because I, I see that a lot of children and younger people, not only children now, adults, into gaming and sometimes these games can have a very uh, negative edge to them, you know, that encourage aversion, anger and negative mind states. And we can see it in the work environment, some work environments too have a very negative aspect to them, which can be uh, very corrosive for people. And as, and also with the social media, the news, internet, a lot of it, you can see a lot of these sorts of negative emotions on, on them. So these things can influence us. So our job is not to be influenced, <laughs> to recognize it for what it is. A whole lot of suffering and not, 
not leading to our happiness, well-being, uh, or to other people's happiness and well-being. And to develop the opposite is very important. So first of all, to recognize it in its entirety as much as possible is important. To recognize where it's coming from. Is it coming from outside or is it coming from within? And of course, from the Buddhist perspective, it's coming from within. If we did not have that anger, that ill will, irritation, how could we get angry? It would not be possible. It wouldn't be in here. So this is a big part of the practice. But recognizing that the environment we live in, the friends we hang out with, the, have an influence on us, then we can uh, wisely deal with those things. But of course for the Buddha, the main um, method, what's the main method for dealing with anger? Yeah, absolutely. There are lots of other other things one can do, but loving kindness is is number one. Um, I'll probably give a talk sometime soon about dealing with anger. You know how we can effectively deal with it, especially from the point of view of speech. But now, maybe just to finish off, just a brief uh, loving kindness uh, meditation, because this is this is the most uh, important antidote to you know, in these negative mind states, even to fear, anxiety, these things. If we have loving kindness in the mind, these, there's no room for these negative mind states. Less room, anyway. <laughs> the mind's pretty tricky and quick, so it's, uh, it's something that's possible. So uh, metta, or loving kindness, is something the Buddha taught and made much of. All human beings have it, not only Buddhists. Everyone has it, but the Buddha made a lot of it. And it's that feeling of well-wishing, friendliness, kindness, acceptance, goodwill, appreciation, those things. And it's for reconditioning our mind. Not only is it a pleasant experience, it gives us what we want, which is this love within ourselves. We're often looking at, looking for it from somebody else, outside ourselves, but actually, in fact, when we develop a metta, loving kindness in ourselves, we have that love. So... And there's uh, one of my favorite sayings, if we want to be loved, we may not be, but if we want to give love, who can stop us? And that's a nice saying, isn't it? So, now we can just uh, do a little bit of meta meditation, just for, it's nearly half past, so just five or ten minutes, here we are. So, if we can, this is our Christmas goodwill too. <laughs> if we can close the eyes, get in contact with the body, and just feel what's most comfortable for the body. And we can bring to mind an intention to give a gift of being a best friend to ourselves and then to share it with other beings. To give this gift. And we just think for a moment of the qualities of being a best friend. What, what does that mean for each of us? Friendly, joyful, appreciative, warm, kind, generous, understanding, whatever it is. And the first thing we can do is visualize giving this gift to ourselves, to our bodies and minds. Giving this gift of friendliness, warmth, acceptance, forgiveness, kindness. Relaxing the body and relaxing the mind with this goodness, this kindness, this warmth, this openness. And we can imagine breathing in this friendliness and breathing it out to the world. Just completely relaxing, 
body with this warmth, this gift, beautiful gift of being a best friend, breathing it in and breathing it out as a gift to the world. And now we can expand this feeling of being a best friend to ourselves, to the breath, to the body, to the, our minds, to everybody here in this hall. This feeling of being a best friend, being warm, accepting, understanding expanding it to everybody who is watching <laughs> watching this talk this friendliness being a best friend and expanding it beyond this hall to the area around it, to the whole of Melbourne, being a best friend to all the beings. And expanding it to the whole world, with this friend of being a best friend to all beings. May they be free of fear, worry, irritation and anger, giving this gift. Now we can come back to ourselves and just have an aspiration to develop this feeling of being a best friend for ourselves and for others, as much as we can develop this. Whether we're meditating, whether we're working, studying, at home, wherever. And may my speech and actions come from this meta as well this loving kindness, being a best friend. And we can anchor this feeling of loving kindness in our hearts so that we can turn to it any time of day or night like a refuge. Now we can just briefly review the meditation just to see how do we feel now. Do we feel more friendly, kind, safe and relaxed or not? And what caused these feelings to come up? And so we can slowly come out of the meditation, open the eyes and move the body. So, 
like to. So that's the. It's very important that we remember that even though there's this negative root in all unenlightened beings' minds, these negative roots of greed, uh, aversion, and delusion in our minds, there is non-greed. There's non. Uh, aversion, non-hate, and non-delusion there as well. And that very much so, by developing the, um, the non-aversion, the, in this case loving-kindness, it can be compassion, it can be uh, patience, it can be contentment, all these things, thankfulness. By developing those, we're actually letting go of some of the negative qualities in our mind, diminishing them, because we're giving them less airspace. <laughs> which is very good. So this practice of, the, the, of positive qualities is also conditioning us to, if we do a lot of metta meditation, that's what comes up very naturally. It will come up very quickly. If we do a, if we do a lot of uh, um, developing anger and irritation, annoyance, that can come up very quickly. But for us, you know, if we develop metta, these things, loving kindness, that can become... Out the default position we come from because our experience is one of conditioning of habits really and we have the choice whether we choose good habits and habits that lead to a pleasant experience, happiness for us and others or we choose ones that don't that lead to unhappiness and suffering maybe coming from a strong sense of self maybe coming from a strong sense of being right. That's a, that's a dangerous one, <laughs> being right. So I wish you well for developing the positive roots, the wholesome roots in the mind. Tree's gone. <laughs> and uh, not allowing the uh, bushfire of greed, hatred and delusion to, to burn, burn us, to give, to give rise to suffering for ourselves and others. Because in reality... The, you know, the bushfire, a physical bushfire is one thing, but the negative qualities in the mind can do far, far more damage than even the bushfire can do. And we can see that in human history. So it's, it's our contribution to Christmas, to peace and goodwill on earth by developing these positive qualities, these positive roots, and putting out the bushfire within us. That's what we can do, really, <laughs> put out the bushfire within us. But that has a big effect. You know, one person, the Buddha, did that, and, and it's still going. <laughs> you know, so this is good news that it's a possibility within us uh, that we can contain and completely eliminate the bushfires within. So I'd like to finish the talk there and, and wish Dr. Jaya and Kanti a happy birthday and dedicate the merit to Percy for his happy happiness and well-being a good re rebirth if he is reborn. And uh, I ask if there are any questions, just briefly we can have questions or com comments or complaints. I know you're going to say, oh, it was such a downer. <laughs> what are you talking about? Oh, suffering again. <laughs> I remember one monk at Bodhinyan said, oh, that monk who was talking about another monk, he said, oh, he only talks about suffering. <laughs> Who's complaining? I thought, oh, well, it's not bad. The Buddha did too. Remember the saying I, what I said last week that uh, oh, the Buddha said, all that I teach is, is suffering or unsatisfactoriness and its end to reach. It's good to point out end to reach, you know, because he wasn't just talking about the, um, the difficulties of our lives, he was talking about the solution. Good. Good. Thank you. Oh, there's one. There. Ajahn, there are two online questions. Yes, yeah, good, good. Before those, are just the whole topic of burning reminds me of a little bit of one of um, Ajahn Sumedho's talks, and he says the holy life is like a holocaust because you burn up all your attachments. Yes. It's another way of using Looking the fire. Yeah, fire analogy. is purifying in that sense. Yeah, mm. yes. The f um, there is a question about another. Um, monastics teachings but I think we'll skip that one just for today yeah. because I'm not sure where that would lead um, <laughs> in day to day this is another question from Matt in day to day living yeah. how do we take the time to understand and know how we are reacting to negative or positive feelings 
Well, the, the, the way for the, to do that, to know how we're reacting to negative or positive feelings is to, to be mindful, isn't it? And this is the chitana pasana. I mean, it's a very grand title, you know, it sounds very uh, technical, but it is actually just being aware of our emotions and what state the mind is in, whether they, you know, the, very basically the Buddha said, is there greed, hatred or delusion in the mind or not, you know? and other emotions too, just knowing their presence and their absence. And having that interest to look at that, you know, to be aware of that is the, is the first thing actually, to realize that by being interested in that, that actually leads to our well-being and happiness because we can identify things, we can be clear about things. Because oftentimes the, a lot of these emotions, they're sort of automatic, they come up very automatically because they've got these shortcuts built in already. And so we need quite a bit of mindfulness to see where they're coming from, to get to the cause. Because of course in Buddhism, unless we see the cause in, in life actually, what can we do? We can't do anything. So really the answer to this question is you know, to just develop that mindfulness, that awareness of um, you know, what, what, we're, what we're experiencing is the most important thing. In, and this is in terms of the quality of the mind, you know, the emotions that are running, and uh, you know, maybe the thought going on, distracted mind, whatever it is, to be aware of it. But also to be aware of it when it isn't there. That's important, because when you, you've got the two, when it's present, and when it isn't there, you've got a comparison, haven't you? You can just see what is, what is better. <laughs> And uh, it gives you information also about what's causing that, that uh, mind state to come up, whether it be greed or uh, aversion or delusion. So that's, that's what I would say. It's not easy. Mindfulness is, is something we, we have to bring to it. But if there's a sense of interest and a realization that if we understand something, it will be for our well-being. And there's a certain satisfaction and joy that comes from understanding things, looking at things, investigating them. Instead of just becoming that emotion, we're actually looking at it. We're standing back a little bit, you know, and taking, taking it in, getting a perspective. So we're seeing it rather than being it. That's what I say. <laughs> That's the theory, but it's, it's true. We encourage this mindfulness of what we're experiencing. So I hope that was help you, helpful for, is it Matthew? Or? Matt, yeah, yeah. And the last one here online is, mm. um, I started letting things go during mm. arguments. Now I am happier, but I do not solve my problems. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think that delaying for the proper timing is an amicable solution? Do you think delaying? That delaying for the proper timing, I think mm -hmm. maybe to actually try to resolve the issue mm -hmm. rather than just arguing on the spot, is mm -hmm. an amicable solution? Yeah. We, we can uh, let go in uh, at two levels. Let go, you know, in the sense of you know, wanting to finish the the argument, the disagreement, can't we? Can do that. But we may not have let go inside. <laughs> you know, actually may think, oh, I'm right, is that completely wrong? And be really, you know, wound up and connected to it. That's much more difficult to uh, let go of because we need an understanding that this is actually, you know, just causing me suffering, first of all, causing me um, a very unpleasant experience, this ill will, this aversion that I'm experiencing inside, to understand that f and to see where it's coming from, you know, is, is, will allow us to let go. But uh, letting go, you know, to, um, you know, to solve the actual physical situation is, is good. And then, yes, it is good if we can, afterwards, we can look back and revisit it and understand it much, much better. Because when we're inter interacting, it's all coming very fast and f uh, very fast. So we're not, we can't, can't really understand the, uh, what's really going on. Because a lot of that's on automatic. <laughs> Somebody says something, and up, 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 this comes, and so forth. But, but afterwards is always good. I mean, you know, during is, is good. And sense of restraint, if we let go from the sense of, um, um, you know, restraining the mind, not letting it, this uh, disagreement, this negative quality in ourselves too, get bigger and bigger. That's a, that's a good thing too, actually. It can be a good thing. As long as people don't feel like 
later they've been walked over, you know, I, I should have stood up for myself, you know, et cetera, et cetera, those sorts of feelings. Um, I think, you know, uh, that can be quite a skillful thing to do in the immediate case. But to look back is always good, you know, and uh, that's how we learn, actually, we learn from our experience. So thank you for that, uh, Matt, yes. So I think, is that it? Sorry, I will just um, just finish. This person who asked the question mm. has repeated the question mm. because it just says um, a few words on Aya Kema. Oh yeah, would be lovely. Um, maybe some other time. But yes. could you let Ajahn Nisarana know at least that there is interest mm. in his teacher? Thank you. I just didn't. I wasn't sure how that would open. Yes, no, no, that's good. That's a good one because I would say, and one of her favourite teachings, one of my favourite teachings for her was that what we experience in life is just often outside ourselves. It's a trigger for for our reactions. If we didn't have them within us, we could not we could not really react in a negative way, whether it be greed, hatred, and delusion. So she said, these are all triggers for us. You know, what a person says, what they do, what you hear on the radio, what you see on the internet. All these things are just triggers that bring it up within us. And that's, that's good to remember because it reminds us that it's inside us. It's not the outside trigger that we need to deal with. You know, we need... Because she would always talk about the blaming game too. You know, we can blame the government, we can blame this person, we can work and so on and so forth. It's no use, you know, it, it's very little satisfaction we get from that. And it doesn't really get to the cause. It doesn't make us feel happier. It may make us feel we're right, but it doesn't make us feel happy. So she would talk like that about triggers. And she had a lovely one uh, image of the jack-in-the-box. you remember that one, Helen? The jack-in-the-box that, you know, these, it's very old-fashioned now. She'd say it in, uh, at that time in the 80s, 90s, people knew Jack in the box is a doll that's in a box, and you top, touch the top of the box, and it jumps out. and And the kids, kids in those days, oh, whoa! These days, I think they probably say, "So what? <laughs> Isn't there anything better?" <laughs> but then I would say, "But what happens if you take the spring out of the box? It doesn't matter how hard you hit it; it's not going to jump out." And it's the same for us. If we take anger, if we take greed, if we take delusion out of the box inside our hearts, our minds. We won't react. We won't fly off the handle. We won't lose it. So this is this is Aya's message. So thank you for that. That reminds me, you know, of Aya's really, you know, um, key teachings, which is, you know, uh, she would say, her formula too went that went with that was recognition of a situation, no blame, either other person or ourselves, and then change, change to what we we, we see as more positive. More we, uh, in our better interests to develop. So thank you for that. That's good. Well, he uh, the person thanks you because he was in Germany and he waited up to. Oh, all right. To get that message, so he's, uh, no, he's very nice. grateful. That's good. That's good. Because yeah. So now we can those who'd like to. First of all, we can also remember those that are affected by the bushfires here in Australia, to to uh, give them their support. You know for. That this this uh, terrible situation is overcome, that they deal with it in the best possible way uh, that they can, and keep them in mind, you know, because it is a very difficult situation for a lot of people at the moment, and very worrying for them. So now, those who would like to, we can pay respects to the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha. <laughs>